G'day, Dr. Jack Cordy here, and today I'm going to be continuing to persuade you that free will doesn't exist. And today we're going to be looking at sort of psychological determinism on, a, on, a, on a multiple levels, sort of, sort of going up rather than individual decisions, but who you are as a person, what are your personality traits? Um, uh, are they truly free to develop? Now, this is probably going to be the most challenging one for you because it really challenges your identity as a human being um but i just go with it honestly you'll feel less stressed if you just believe it and just go with it anyway here we go let's jump into it jump into it here's little albert now um we used to do very unethical experiments right um and we learned a lot from them but they were very unethical and this is a classic example of this this is the little albert, albert experiment in 1920. they took this nine month old baby and this nine month old baby and they exposed it to a bunch of fluffy stuff. A rabbit, um, a sheepskin, uh, a rat, even a guy dressed up like the Easter Bunny, which is kind of twisted when you think about it. And little Albert loved them all. He, he had no feelings towards them. He, you see him like reaching and grabbing for this rat. He has no fear or anything like that. He loves them all. What they did next was they exposed them to all these things over and over again. And every time they exposed them to it, they would hit a piece of metal with a hammer um, behind his head really loudly um, and he would get a massive fright and little Albert started to associate this fearful thing happening with the fluffy things and he got this association so here we can see little Albert has been given a nice little cute little fluffy rabbit and he immediately bursts into tears gosh this is an unethical experiment so we lost a little bit. However, researchers delved into it, looked at genealogy, and they came across this guy called William Albert Barger, who was likely little Albert based on age and photos of him at that age and the hospital of birth and the fact that there was a family connection with the nurse um, and so on and so forth. So it seems very likely this guy was little Albert. And uh, everyone called him Albert. Albert Barger died at the age of 87. And when he died, he had a well-known fear of dogs and other fluffy things. And in fact, um, his family members, including his wife, would tease him about it, which sounds horrible. Now, this central personality, quite peculiar trait, happened because of this extreme event, right? And when, when we see that extreme events cause these behaviors and these choices, um, then we can probably infer that even mild events have milder impacts, but intricate impact on who you are as a person, your fears, your likes, your dislikes, etc. Probably the best evidence of this is culture, right? So if we look at this, this graph here is depicting percentage of drinks, hot drinks that are tea or coffee. And what we can see is in Kenya, 99.2% of hot drinks are tea. And in Guatemala, 99.6% of hot drinks are coffee. Now, if we were truly free, not, if, not dramatically influenced by our culture and our environment and our upbringing, we wouldn't expect such homogeneity, uh, ho such homogenous cultures like this, right? Do have Kenyans truly evaluated which is better tea or coffee and then made a free decision to choose between tea or coffee or have they been massively influenced by their environment and their culture to choose tea and if so were they free to choose otherwise or were they always going to choose tea because of the country they're in now you might say that's a rather silly example hot drinks right it's not really important to your identity but we see the same effect with things like religion or political beliefs or many many things and so here we have percentage christian we see 99.1 percent of people in east timor are christian whereas 0.08 percent in the maldives are christian were these people truly free to choose um the religion which is critical to their lives or were they heavily influenced um, by their environment to the point that you know they're influenced to the point that is beyond influence that they were always going to perhaps come this become christian in east timor or, or not christian in the maldives so features which you regard as central to your identity and personality which you would say are a free expression of your unique will i love coffee i hate tea that is a free expression of my unique will but however these Things can be largely predicted by your country of birth, your education, your socioeconomic status, and the year you were born. 
The year you're born is quite an interesting one. If I was born in the 15th century, I would probably believe that women shouldn't have the right to vote, right? But now I'm a feminist and I come from the country, uh, the first country, uh, the first democratic country to give women the vote, New Zealand, 1893, represent. And I would think it's horrible to think that women aren't free, uh, shouldn't, shouldn't have the vote, right? And so the, the question is, did I come to that conclusion freely? Or was I just gr brought up in a society and in a culture and an environment in which that is 100% a human right? And it's, it seems clear to me that if I grew up then, in, in the 15th century, I would believe that women do, don't deserve the, the right to vote. So was I truly free to make that central decision that seems so obvious? And, you know, I'm a feminist and it's important to my identity today. Then there's another factor going on that's out of our control, right? And that's genetic determinism in psychology. So here's a, here's a fun set of experiments, right? Identical twins are almost genetically identical. Apart from a few mutations here and there, they're nearly identical. They have nearly identical DNA, right? And there are, there are twins, that uh, genetically identical twins, that were separated at birth and adopted out. And in this one study, they were adopted out to different countries which they would have experienced vastly different environments and, and different upbringing, different parents and everything. Then we can bring those twins back together again. Here are the twins in this study. One lived in America, one lived in England. And look at their personality traits to see how similar they are compared to, say, two random people in the population. And each of these things on the x-axis is a psychological trait, like aggression here. Um, and here they are, where, where they map on the scale, on the distribution scale, negative 50th percentile and stuff like that, right? And what we can see in the dotted line is the person from the UK and in the black line is the person from the US. And what we can see is that there's a strong genetic component to uh, your psychological attributes. Um, and and this, is, this is fairly robust. It's not 100% here, I've shown an extreme example. But there is fairly good evidence that a good percentage, you know, so it depends on the attribute, but perhaps 50% for some attributes and 80% for other attributes and 20% for other attributes uh, can be attributed to your genetics. And here's a really classic example. Squirrels, we might think, are rather complex mammals who, you know, they play, they build houses, they look after the young, they're very complex. I used to have squirrels in the backyard at UK, in, in the UK, and I used to feed them. It was fantastic. I love squirrels. <laughs> love them. Um, the squirrels were part of, a, again, a rather unethical experiment. Squirrels have this behavior where if you give them a nut, they'll run over, they'll dig it, they'll bury it, and they'll pile it back under, storing it for later, right? So they do this to nuts. They dug holes all throughout my lawn, burying all the nuts I gave them, but it was totally worth it to watch the squirrels, right? But in this experiment, they had squirrels that were raised from birth in cages. These squirrels never saw any other squirrel, and they never saw any nuts, and they never saw any soil. They were just growing in cages. The floor of the cage was made out of metal. It was a cage. It was a full box cage, right? So these squirrels from birth were raised to adulthood in metal cages, having never seen the outside, another squirrel, any soil or any nuts and then they were given a nut and this is what happened a squirrel took the nut ran to the corner of the cage placed uh buried in the air they would dig in the air place the nut down and then they would pack air on top of the nut and then they would go about their day right where did that behavior come from right because that squirrel hasn't been taught it has never seen it has never even seen a nut it was genetically programmed into that squirrel, that behavior, right? So was that squirrel free to do otherwise? We would probably say no, right? There was no freedom in that because every squirrel we give a nut to does that regardless of whether they've seen a nut or grown up in an environment where that behavior is important or whether they've been taught it, right? It's genetically encoded in it. Now, that's just a fantastic example of genetic determinism. Now, the weighting of which I mentioned 20%, 50%, 80%, the weighting of which has been debated for centuries, right? And we call it nature versus nurture. Everyone will have heard this debate. 
what what creates you what's more important your nature or your nurture your genetics or your upbringing right your 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 genetic and epigenetic factors or your parents and your society and everything like that right nature versus nurture what's more important but can we just stop and think you don't have control over either of those right i didn't choose my dna and i didn't choose my nurture and so if nature or nurture create who i am what else could there be right Na nature is sort of the internal forces and nurture is the external forces what else could there be that creates me nothing like there's nothing there's nothing other than nature or nurture right that can can't fit into those two groups i don't have control over either of those features nature or nurture right i don't choose my dna i didn't choose my parents i didn't choose my country of birth i didn't choose the socioeconomic status of my family uh i didn't choose any of that yet this has been the debate for centuries nature versus nurture yet it's taken us a long time to realize that that debate is incongruous with free will right free will can't exist if our personalities and our decisions are all downstream of these two factors of which we have no control over right so there's a fairly good argument that who you are today you had no control over and it's all just deterministic downstream effects of your genetics and your nurture and i'm willing to bet you're still unconvinced right you still see this illusion of free will and you can't give it up. You can't give up your personal identity. You can't give up the idea that you have free will. That is a really hard thing to do. And so these squares still seem like two different shades of gray and you still believe in free will. But let me tell you, right, after four videos or whatever I'm up to, I think this next video is going to get you. This next video, we're going over consciousness and free will. And I think I might for a second, convince you that free will doesn't exist in the next video.